Sir David Maxwell Fife will now follow with the case of von Neurath. May it please the tribunal, the presentation against the defendant von Neurath falls into five parts. And the first of these is concerned with the following positions and honors which he held. He was a member of the Nazi party from the 30th of January, 1937 until 1945 and was awarded the Golden Party Badge on the 30th of January, 1937. He was a general in the SS. He was personally appointed Gruppenführer by Hitler in September, 1937, and promoted to Obergruppenführer on the 21st of June, 1943. He was Reich Minister for Foreign Affairs under the chancellorship of the defendant von Papen from the 2nd of June of 1932 and under the chancellorship of Hitler from the 30th of January, 1933 until he was replaced by the defendant von Ribbentrop on the 4th of February, 1938. He was a Reich Minister from the 4th of February, 1938 until May, 1945. He was President of the Secret Cabinet Council, to which he was appointed on the 4th of February, 1938 and he was a member of the Reich Defense Council. He was appointed Reich's protector for Bohemia and Moravia from the 18th of March, 1939, until he was replaced by the defendant Frick on the 25th of August, 1943. He was awarded the Adler Orden by Hitler at the time of his appointment as Reich's protector, the defendant Ribbentrop was the only other German to receive this declaration. If the tribunal please, these facts are collected in document 2972 PS, which is United States exhibit number 19. And in that uh, document, which is signed by the defendant and his counsel, the defendant makes comments on certain of these matters with which I should like to deal. He says that the award of the Golden Party badge was made on the 30th of January, 1937, against his will and without being asked. I point out that this defendant not only refrained from repudiating the allegedly unwanted honor, but after receiving it, attended meetings at which wars of aggression were planned, actively participated in the rape of Austria, and tyrannized over <coughs> Bohemia and Maveria, Ma Moravia. His second point is that his appointment as Gruppenführer was also against his will and without his being asked. On that point, the prosecution submits that the wearing of the uniform, the receipt of the further promotion to Obergruppenführer and the actions against Bohemia and Moravia must be considered when the defendant's submission is examined. He then says that his appointment as foreign minister was by Reich's president von Hindenburg. We 
submit we need not do more than draw attention to the personalities of the defendant von Papen and Hitler and to the fact that President von Hindenburg died in 1934. This defendant continued as foreign minister till 1938. He then says that he was an inactive minister from the 4th of February 1938 until May 1945. At the moment, attention is drawn to the activities which will be mentioned below and to the terrible evidence as to Bohemia and Moravia, which will be forthcoming from my friend, the Soviet chief prosecutor. This defendant's next point is that the secret cabinet council never sat or conferred. I point out to the tribunal that this was described as a select committee of the cabinet for the deliberation of foreign affairs and the tribunal will find that description in document 1774 PS, which I now put in as exhibit GB246. That is an extract from a book by a well-known author, and on the page two of the document book, the document book is numbered in red at the top right-hand corner, the first page of that document, in about uh, seven lines from the bottom of the page, they will see that among the bureaus um, subordinated to the Führer and Reich Councillor for direct counsel and assistance. Number four is the Privy Cabinet Council, President Reich Minister Freiherr von Neurath. And if the tribunal will be kind enough to turn over to page four, about ten lines from the top, they will see paragraph beginning, a Privy Cabinet Council to advise the Führer on the basic problems of foreign policy has been created by the decree of 4th February 1938. The reference is given. This Privy Cabinet Council is under the direction of Reich Minister von Neurath and includes the Foreign Minister, the Air Minister, Deputy Commander, the Propaganda Minister, the Chief of the Reich Chancellery, the Commanders in Chief of the Army and Navy, and the Chief of the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces. The Privy Cabinet Council constitutes a select staff of collaborators of the Führer, which consists exclusively of members of the Government of the Reich. Thus it represents a select committee of the Reich Government for the deliberation on foreign affairs. And uh, the, in order to have the formal composition of the body, that is shown in document 2031 PS, which is exhibit GB 217. I did that has been put in, I needn't read it again. Now the next uh, point that uh, the defendant makes as to his offices is that he was not a member of the Reich Defense Council. If I may very shortly take that point by stages, I remind the tribunal that the Reich Defense Council was set up soon after Hitler's accession to power on the 4th of April, 1933. And the tribunal will find a note of that point in document 2261 PS, United States exhibit um, 19, exhibit 24. And 
they will find that on the top of page 12 of the document book, there is a reference to the date of the establishment of the Reich Defense Council. The Reich Defense Council is also dealt with in document 2986 PS, United States Exhibit 409, which is the affidavit of the defendant Frick, which the tribunal will find on page 14. About the middle of that short affidavit, the defendant Frick says, we were also members of the Reich Defense Council, which was supposed to plan preparation and decrees in case of war, which later on were published by the Ministerial Council for the Defense of the Reich. Now, the, that the membership of this council included the Minister for Foreign Affairs, who was then the defendant von Neurath, is shown by document EC 177, United States Exhibit 390. And if the tribunal will turn to the document, page 16 of the document book, they will find that document. And at the foot of the page, composition, uh, the composition of the Reich Defense Council permanent members, including the Minister for Foreign Affairs, that document is dated Berlin, 22nd of May, 1933, which was during this defendant's tenure at that office, and the then, that's the first, the, the, the first stage, the functioning of this council with a representative of this defendant's department von Bülow, present, is shown by the meetings of the 12th, the minutes of the 12th meeting on 14th of May, 1936. That is document EC 407, which I put in, what's the number? What? As I put in as GB 247. That's, uh, the tribunal will find that at uh, page 21, the minutes are for the 14th of May 1936, and the actual reference to an intervention of von Bülow from the Foreign Office is in the middle of page 22. Then uh, the next period was after the secret law of the 4th September 1938. This defendant was, under the terms of that law, a member of the Reich Defense Council by virtue of his office as president of the secret cabinet council. That is shown by um, document 2194 PS, United States Exhibit 36, which uh, the um, tribunal will find at page 24. And if you look at page 24, it will, will see that the actual copy which was put in evidence was enclosed in a letter addressed to the Reich Protector in Bohemia and Moravia on the 6th of September, 1939. Rather curious that the Reich Protector for Bohemia and Moravia is now denying his membership of the Council when the letter enclosing the law is one addressed to him. But if the tribunal will be good enough to turn on to the page 28, which is still that document, the last words on that page describe the tasks of that council. They say the task of the Reich Defense Council consists in peacetime in the decision on all measures for the preparation of the Reich Defense 
and the gathering together of all forces and means of the nation according to the two parties. Sorry, I beg your pardon. The foot of page 28 I was reading for, from, and it begins, the task of the Reich Defense Council consists in peacetime in the decision on all measures for the preparation of the Reich defense and the gathering together of all forces and means of the nation according to the directions of the leader and Reich Chancellor. The tasks of the Council in wartime will be specially determined by the leader and Reich Chancellor. If the Tribunal will turn to the next page, you will see that the permanent members of the Council are, then the seventh one is the President of the Secret Cabinet Council, who was again this defendant. I submit that that uh, deals for every relevant period with this defendant's statement that he was not a member of the Reich Defence Council. The second broad point that the prosecution make against this defendant is that in assuming the position of Minister of Foreign Affairs in Hitler's government, this defendant assumed charge of a foreign policy committed to breaches of treaties. We say first that the Nazi party had repeatedly and for many years made known its intention to overthrow German, Germany's international commitments even at the risk of war. We refer to sections one and two of the party program, which as the tribunal has heard was published year after year that is on page 32 of the document book. It's document 1708 PS and United States Exhibit 255. And uh, I just remind the tribunal of these one, points one and two. We demand the unification of all Germans in the greater Germany on the basis of the right of self-determination of peoples. Two, we demand equality of rights for the German people in respect of, uh, to the other nations, abrogation of the peace treaties of Versailles and Saint-Germain. But probably clearer than that is the reprise contained in Hitler's speech at Munich on the 15th of March 1939 and the tribunal will find the one of the references to that in on page 40 and if I may warn the tribunal in the document book page 40 appears directly after page 34 I'm sorry some of the pages have got out of order but on page 40 at the middle of the page, they will find a reference to that speech. It begins that my foreign policy had identical aims. My program was to abolish the Treaty of Versailles. It is futile nonsense for the rest of the world to pretend today that I did not reveal this program until 1933 or 1935 or 1937. Instead of listening to the foolish chatter of Emmy Gray, these gentlemen would have been wiser to read what I have written thousands of times. If it is futile nonsense for foreigners to raise that point, it would be still more futile for Hitler's foreign minister to suggest that he was ignorant of the aggressive designs of the policy. But I remind the tribunal that the acceptance of force as a means of solving international problems 
and achieving the objectives of Hitler's foreign policy must have been known to anyone as closely in touch with Hitler as the defendant von Neurath and I remind the tribunal simply by reference to the passages from Mein Kampf which were quoted by my friend Mr. Elwyn Jones especially those on the, towards the end of the book, pages 552, 553, and 554. So that the prosecutions say that by the acceptance of this foreign policy, the defendant von Nauert assisted and promoted the accession to power of the Nazi party. The third broad point is that in his capacity as Minister of Foreign Affairs, this defendant directed the international aspects of the first phase of the Nazi conspiracy, the consolidation of control in preparation for war. As I've already indicated, from his close connection with Hitler, this defendant must have known the cardinal points of Hitler's policy leading up to the outbreak of the World War, as outlined in retrospect by Hitler in his speech to his military leaders on the 23rd of November 1939. This policy had two facets. Internally, the establishment of rigid control. Externally, the program to release Germany from its international ties. The external program had four points. One, secession from the disarmament conference. Two, the order to rearm Germany. Three, the introduction of compulsory military service. And four, the remilitarization of the Rhineland. If the tribunal would look at page 35, which I'm afraid they'll find after page 41 in the document book, in the, at the end of the first paragraph, I think they will find these points very briefly set out, and perhaps I might just read that passage. It's document 789 PS, United States Exhibit 23 about ten lines before the break. I had to reorganize everything, beginning with the mass of the people and extending it to the armed forces. First reorganization of the interior, ab abolishment of appearance of decay and defeatist ideas, education to heroism. While reorganizing the interior, I undertook the second task <coughs> to release Germany from its international ties. Two particular characteristics are to be pointed out. Secession from the League of Nations and denunciation of the disarmament conference. It was a hard decision. The number of profits who predicted that it would lead to the occupation of the Rhineland was large. The number of believers was very small. I was supported by the nation which stood firmly behind me when I carried out my intentions. After that, the order for rearmament. Here again, there were numerous prophets who predicted misfortunes and only a few believers. In 1935, the introduction of compulsory armed service. After that, militarization of the Rhineland, again a process believed to be impossible at the time. The number of people who put trust in me was very small. Then the beginning of the fortification of the whole country, especially in the West. When I, these are summarized as four points, and the defendant von Neurath participated directly and personally in accomplishing each of these four aspects of Hitler's foreign policy. 
at the same time officially proclaiming that these measures did not constitute steps towards aggression. The first are matters of history. When Germany left the disarmament conference, this defendant sent a telegram dated the 14th of October 1933 to the president of the conference, and that will be found in the Documenta der Deutschen Politik on page 94 of the first volume for that year. Similarly, this defendant made the announcement of Germany's withdrawal from the League of Nations on the 21st October 1933. That again will be found in the official documents. These are referred to in the transcript of the proceedings of this trial on pages 402 and 450 and I remind the tribunal of the complementary documents of military preparation, which of course were ready, which are documents C-140, United States Exhibit 51, the 25th October 1933, and C-153, United States Exhibit 43, from the 12th of May 1934. These have already been read and I merely collect them for the uh, memory and assistance of the tribunal. The second point is the rearmament of Germany. And this defendant was foreign minister when <clears throat> on the 10th of March 1935, the German government officially announced the re-establishment of the German Air Force. That is document TC44. Exhibit GB11, which has already been referred to. On the 21st of May 1935, <coughs> Hitler announced a perpetrated unilateral repudiation of the naval and military and air clauses of the Treaty of Versailles, which of course involved a similar perpetrated <coughs> unilateral repudiation of the same clauses of the Treaty for the Restoration. <coughs> of friendly relations with the United States, and that will be found in document 2288 PS, United States Exhibit 38, which is, again has already been read. On the same day, the Reich Cabinet, of which this defendant was a member, enacted the secret Reich Defense Law creating the Office of Plenipotentiary General for War Economy, afterwards described by the Wehrmacht armament expert as the cornerstone of German rearmament. The reference to the law is <coughs> document 2261 PS, United States Exhibit 24, a letter of von Blomberg dated the 24th of June 1935, in closing this law, which is already before the tribunal, and the reference to the comment on the importance of the law is document 2353 PS, United States Exhibit 35. Some of that has already been read, but if the tribunal will be good enough to turn to um, page 52, where that appears, they will find an extract from page 35. And if I might just give the tribunal the last sentence, it's the first reference. The latest orders were decreed in the Reich Defense Law of May 21st, 1935, supposed to be published only in case of war but already declared valid for carrying out war preparations. As this law fixed the duties of the armed forces and the other Reich authorities in case of war, it was also the fundamental ruling for the development and activity of the war economy organization. The third point is the introduction of compulsory military service and on the 16th of March 1935, this defendant signed 
the law for the organization of the armed forces, which provided for universal military service and anticipated a vastly expanded German army. This was described by the defendant Keitel as the real start of the large-scale rearmament program which followed. I give the official reference in the Reich Gazetteblatt and the references in the transcript, pages 411, 454 and 455. Fourth point was the remilitarization of the Rhineland. The Rhineland was reoccupied on the 7th of March, 1936. I remind the tribunal of the two complementary documents, 2289 PS, United States Exhibit 56, the announcement of this action by Hitler, and C-139, United States Exhibit 53, which is the Operation Schulung, giving the military um, action which was to be taken if necessary. Again, the reference to the transcript is page 458 to 464. These were the acts for which the defendant shared responsibility from his position and from the steps which he took. But a little later, he summed up his views on the actions detailed above in a speech before Germans abroad made on the 29th of August 1937, which I ask the tribunal to take judicial notice as it appears in Das Archive at page, for 1937 on page 650. But I quote a short portion of it that appears on page 72 of the document book. The unity of the racial and national will created through Nazism with unprecedented elan has made possible a foreign policy through which the bonds of the Versailles Treaty were slashed, freedom to arm regained, and the sovereignty of the whole nation re-established. We have again become master in our own home and we have produced the means of power to remain henceforth that way for all times. The world should notice from Hitler's deeds and words that his aims are not aggressive war. The world, of course, had not the advantage of seeing these various complementary documents of military preparation, which I have had the advantage of putting before the tribunal. The next uh, section, next, and the next point against this defendant, is that both as Minister of Foreign Affairs and as one of the inner circle of the Führer's advisers on foreign political matters, this defendant participated in the political planning and preparation for acts of aggression against Austria, Czechoslovakia and other nations. If I might first put the defendant's policy in a sentence, I put it, I say that it can be summarized as breaking one treaty only at a time. He himself put it, if I may say so, slightly more pompously, but to the same effect, in a speech before the Academy of German Law on the 30th of October 1937, which appears in Das Archiv, October 1937, at page 921, and the tribunal will find in the document book on page 73. The underlining is mine. Out of the acknowledgement of these elementary facts, the Reich cabinet has always interceded in favor of treating every concrete international problem 
within methods specially suited for it. Not to complicate it unnecessarily by amalgamation with other problems, and as long as problems between only two powers are concerned, to choose the way for an immediate understanding between these two powers. We are in a position to state that this method has fully proved itself good, not only in the German interest, but also in the general interest. The only person whose interest to a country whose interests are not mentioned are the other parties to the various treaties that were dealt with in that way. And the working out of that policy can really be shown by looking in tabular form at the actions of this defendant when he was foreign minister or of his immediate successor when he still purported to have influence. In 1935, the action was directed against the West Western powers. That action was the rearmament of Germany. When that was going on, another country had to be reassured. At that time, it was Austria with the support of Italy, which Austria still had up to 1935. And so you get the fraudulent assurance, the essence of the technique, in that case given by Hitler on the 21st of May 1935, and that is shown clearly to be false by the documents which Mr. Alderman put in. I give the general reference to the transcript on page 534, 545. Then in 1936, you've still got the action necessary against the West Western powers the occupation of the Rhineland. You still have a fraudulent assurance to Austria in the treaty of 11th of July of that year, and that is shown to be fraudulent by the letters from the defendant von Papin, United States Exhibit 64 and 67, one of which my friend Major Barrington has just referred. Then in 37 and 38, you move on a step and the action is directed against Austria. We know what that action is. It was absorption, planned, at any rate, finally, at the meeting on the 5th of November, 1937, action taken on the 11th of March, 1938. Reassur reassurance had to be given to the Western powers. So you have the assurance to Belgium on the 13th of October, 1937, which was dealt with by my friend, Mr. Roberts. In your, the tribunal will find the references in pages 1100 to 1126 of the transcript. We move forward a year and the object of the aggressive action becomes Czechoslovakia. She said, move forward six months to a year. There you have the, the Sudetenland obtained in September, the absorption of the whole of Bohemia and Moravia on the 15th of March, 1939. Then it was necessary to reassure Poland. So an assurance to Poland is given by Hitler on the 20th of February, 1938, and repeated up to the 26th of September, 1938. The falsity of that assurance was shown over and over again in Colonel Griffith Jones's speech on Poland, which the tribunal will find on the, in the transcript on pages 966 to 1060. Then finally, 
when you want the action is directed against Poland in the next year for its conquest, assurance must be given to Russia and so a non-aggression pact is entered into on the 23rd of August 1939 as shown by Mr. Alderman on pages 1160 to 1216. With regard to that tabular presentation, one might say in the Latin tag, res ipsa loquitur, but a quite frank statement from this defendant with regard to the earlier part of that can be found in the account of his conversation with the United States Ambassador, Mr. Bullitt, on the 18th of May, 1936, which is on page 74 of the document book, document L150, United States Exhibit 65. And if I might read the first, the first paragraph after the introduction of saying that they called on this defendant, Mr. Bullitt says, von Norat said that it was the policy of the German government to do nothing active in foreign affairs until the Rhineland had been digested. He explained that he meant that until the German fortifications had been constructed on the French and Belgian frontiers, the German government would do everything possible to prevent rather than encourage an outbreak by the Nazis in Austria and would pursue a quiet line with regard to Czechoslovakia. As soon as our fortifications are constructed and the countries of Central Europe realize that France cannot enter German territory at will, all these countries will begin to feel very differently about their foreign policies and a new constellation will develop, he said. Remind the tribunal without citing it of the conversation referred to by my friend Mr. Barrington a short time ago between um, the defendant von Papen as ambassador and Mr. Messersmith, which is very much to the same effect. Well, then I come to the actual aggression against Austria and I remind the tribunal that this defendant was foreign minister first during the early Nazi plottings against Austria in 1934. The tribunal will find these in the transcript pages 475 to 489 and I remind them generally that that was the murder of Chancellor Dolphus and the um, ancillary acts which were afterwards so strongly approved. Secondly, when the false assurance was given to Austria on the 21st of May 1935 and the fraudulent treaty made on the 11th of July 1936. References to these are TC 26, which is a GB 19, and TC 22, which is GB 20, and the reference in the transcript to pages 544 and 545. And thirdly, when the defendant von Papen was carrying on his subterranean intrigues in the period from 1935 to 1937, and I again give the references to the tribunal have in mind, document 2247PS, United States Exhibit 64, and two two, letter dated 17th May 1935, and United States Exhibit 67, document 2246, United States Exhibit 67, document 2246 PS, 1st September 1936. And the references in the transcript are pages 492, 516 to 18, 526 to 545, and 553 to 4. Secondly, the defendant 
This defendant, von Neurath, was present when Hitler declared at the Hausbach interview on the 5th of November 1937 that the German question could only be solved by force and that his plans were to conquer Austria and Czechoslovakia. That is document 386 PS, United States Exhibit 25, which the tribunal will find at page 82. And if they'll look at the sixth line of page 82, after the statement, the heading, they see that one of the persons in attendance this highly confidential meeting was the Reich Minister for Foreign Affairs, Freiherr von Neurath. And without re-reading a document which this tribunal have had referred to them more than once, now I remind the tribunal that it's on page 86 that the passage about the conquest of Austria, it occurs, and if the tribunal will, will look after two and three, the, the next sentence is, for the improvement of our military political position, it must be our first aim. In every case of entanglement by war, to conquer Czechoslovakia and Austria simultaneously, in order to remove <coughs> any threat from the flanks in case of a possible advance eastward. That is developed in the succeeding page. The important point is that this defendant was present at that meeting and it is impossible for him after that meeting to say that he was not acting with except with his eyes completely open and with complete comprehension as to what was intended. Then the next point, during the actual Anschluss, he received a note from the British ambassador dated the 11th of March 1938. That is um, document 3045. P.S. United States Exhibit 127, and he sent the reply contained in document 3287 P.S. United States Exhibit 128. If I might very briefly remind the tribunal of the reply, and uh, I think all that is necessary, because the tribunal has had this document referred to them before, is at the top of page 93 to call attention to two obvious untruths. The defendant von Nara says in the sixth line, it is untrue that the Reich used forceful pressure to bring about this development, especially the assertion which was spread later by the former Chancellor, Schusnig, that the German government had presented the federal president with a conditional ultimatum. It's a pure invention. According to the ultimatum, he had to appoint a proposed candidate as chancellor and to form a cabinet conforming to the proposals of the German government. Otherwise, the invasion of Austria by German troops was held in prospect. The truth of the matter is that the question of sending military or police forces from the Reich was only brought up when the newly formed Austrian cabinet addressed, addressed a telegram already published by the press to the German government urgently asking for the dispatch of German troops as soon as possible in order to restore peace and order and to avoid bloodshed. Faced with the immediately threatening danger of a bloody civil war in Austria, the German government then decided to comply with the appeal addressed to it. Well, as I said, there are 
these are the two most obvious untruths. And all one can say is that it must have a tenor it, um, given the, this defendant a certain macabre sort of humour to write that when the truth was, as the tri tribunal know it, from the report of Gauleiter Rainer to Berkel, which has been put in before the tribunal as document 812 PS, United States Exhibit 21. And when they have heard, as they have at length, the transcripts of the defendant Goering's telephone conversations with Austria on that day, which is document 2949 um, PS, United States Exhibit 76, and the diaries, the entries of the defendant Yodel's diary for the 11th, 13th and 14th February, which is exhibit, um, document 1780 PS, United States Exhibit 72. In this um, abundance of uh, proof, proof of the untruthfulness of these statements, the tribunal may probably think that the most clear and obvious correction is in the um, transcription of the defendant Goering's telephone conversations, which are so amply corroborated by the other documents. And the prosecution submit that it's inconceivable that this defendant, who according to the defendant Yodel's diary, and may I ask the tribunal to just to look at page 116 so that they have this point quite clear. Page 116 of the document book, the entry in Yodel's, uh, Defendant Yodel's diary for the 10th of March. <coughs> it's the third paragraph. It says, at 1300 hours, General Keitel informs Chief of Operational Staff and Admiral Canaris. Ribbentrop is being detained in London. Neurath takes over the Foreign Office. I submit that it's inconceivable that when <coughs> this defendant had taken over the Foreign Office, was dealing with the matter, and as I shall show the tribunal in a moment, cooperating with the defendant Goering to soothe the susceptibilities of the Czechs, that he should have been so ignorant of the truth of events and what really was happening as to write that letter in honour and good faith. His position can be is shown equally clearly um, by the account which is given of him in the affidavit of Mr. Messersmith, document 2385 PS, United States Exhibit 68. The tribunal will look at page 107 of the document book. I remind them of this, of that entry, which exactly describes <coughs> the action and style of activity of this defendant at this crisis. Two-thirds of the way down the page, in the, 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 the paragraph begins, I should emphasize here in this statement that the men who made these promises were not only the died in the wool Nazis, but more conservative Germans 
who already had begun to willingly lend themselves to the Nazi program. In an official dispatch to the Department of State from Vienna dated October 10th, 1935, I wrote as follows. Europe will not get away from the myth that Neurath, Papin, and Mackensen are not dangerous people and that they are diplomats of the old school. They are, in fact, servile instruments of the regime. And just because the outside world looks upon them as harmless, they are able to work more effectively. They are able to sow discord just because they propagate the myth that they are not in sympathy with the regime. May it please the tribunal, before the tribunal adjourned, I was dealing with the share of the defendant von Neurath in the aggression against Austria. Before I proceed to the next stage, I should like the tribunal, if they'd be so kind, as to look at the original exhibit to which I referred, document 3287 PS, United States Exhibit 128, which is the letter from this defendant to Sir Neville Henderson, who was then the British ambassador, the only point in which I'd be grateful that the tribunal would know. What page did you say? Um, it's um, document oh, 3287. It's really on, on the original that I wanted your oh, lordship yes. to look at. It's page 92. It's page 92 of the document book. When I say original, that is a a certified copy, certified by the British Foreign Office. But you, you, the tribunal will see that the heading is from the President of the Secret Cabinet Council. That is the point. The uh, tribunal will remember that the question was raised as to the existence or activity of that body. In a tenor, that letter is headed from this defendant in that capacity. next stage in the Austrian aggression is that at the time of the occupation of Austria, this defendant gave the assurance to Monsieur Masny, the ambassador of Czechoslovakia in Berlin, regarding the continued independence of Czechoslovakia. That is document 100. At the document at page 123, it's TC 27, which I've already put in as exhibit GB 21. It's from <coughs> Monsieur Jan Masaryk to Lord Halifax, who was then Foreign Secretary. And if I might read the, the second paragraph just to remind the tribunal of the circumstances in which it was written. Mr. Masaryk says, I have in consequence been instructed by my government to bring to the official knowledge of His Majesty's government the following facts. Yesterday evening, the 11th of March, Field Marshal Goering made two separate statements to Monsieur Masny, the Czechoslovak minister in Berlin, 
assuring him that the developments in Austria will in no way have any detrimental influence on the relations between the German Reich and Czechoslovakia, and emphasizing the continued earnest endeavor on the part of Germany to improve those mutual relations. Then there are the particulars of the way it was put by the defendant Goering, which the tribunal have had drawn to attention several times. I shan't do it again. And then four paragraphs on. The paragraph begins, Monsieur Masny was in a position to give him definite and binding assurances on this subject, that is to give to the defendant Goering on the Czech mobilization. Then it goes on, and today spoke with Baron von Neurath, who, among other things, assured him on behalf of her Hitler that Germany still considers herself bound by the German Czechoslovak Arbitration Convention concluded at Locarno in October 1925. In view of the fact that the defendant von Neurath had been present at the meeting on the 5th of November, four months previously, when he had heard Hitler's views on Czechoslovakia, and that it was only six months before that freely negotiated treaty was disregarded at once, that paragraph in my submission is an excellent example of the technique which this defendant was the first professor. I now come to the um, aggression against Czechoslovakia. On the 28th of May, 1938, Hitler held a conference of important leaders, including Beck, von Brauschitz, Reda, Keitel, Goering, and Ribbentrop, at which Hitler affirmed that preparations should be made for military action against Czechoslovakia by October. It is believed, but not, I say frankly, confirmed, that the defendant von Neurath attended. The reference to that meeting is in the transcript of page 742 and 743. Sir David, is there any evidence? No, there is no evidence as to giving a complete list of those who attended. It's only a gathering of principal leaders. Therefore, I can't put it higher than that. There's no evidence before the tribunal. The document with reference to the conference doesn't state who was present. No, the. Your Lordship will remember the Falgrun documents that are. A, gr a long series of them, but it doesn't state who was present. Therefore, I expressly put it with reserve. Although On the 4th of September, 1938, the government of which von Neurath was a member enacted a new secret Reich defense law which defined various official responsibilities in clear anticipation of war. This law provided, as did the previous secret Reich defense law, for a Reich Defense Council as a supreme policy board for war preparations. The tribunal will remember that I've already referred them to document 2194 PS, United States Exhibit 36, showing these facts. Then, in order of date, there came the Munich Agreement of 29th September 1938, but in spite of that, on the 15th of March 1939, German troops marched into Czechoslovakia, and the proclamation of Hitler to the German people and the order to the Wehrmacht is document TC50, exhibit GB7, 
which the tribunal will find at page 124, but which has already been referred to and I shan't read it again. On the 16th March 1939, the German government, of which von Norath was still a member, promulgated the decree of the Führer and Reich Chancellor on the establishment of the protectorate Bohemia and Moravia, De that date, the 16th of March. That is um, at page 126 of the document book, document TC 51, exhibit GB 8. If I may leave that for the moment, I'll come back to it in dealing with the set setting up of the <coughs> protectorate. I'll come back in a moment and read Article 5. But taking events in order of time, the following week, the defendant von Ribbentrop signed a treaty with Slovakia, which is at page 129, and the tribunal may remember Article 2 of that treaty, which is for the purpose of making effective the protection undertaken by the German Reich, the German armed forces shall have the right at all times to construct military installations and to keep them garrisoned in the strength they deem necessary in an area delimited in its western side by the frontiers of the state of Slovakia and on its eastern side by a line formed by the eastern rims of the Lower Carpathians, the White Carpathians, and the Avornic Mountains. The government of Slovakia will take the necessary steps to assure that the land required for these installations shall be conveyed to the German armed forces. Furthermore, the government of Slovakia will agree to grant exemption from customs duties for <coughs> imports from the Reich for the maintenance of the German troops and the supply of military installations. The tribunal will appreciate <coughs> that the ultimate objective of Hitler's policy disclosed at the meeting in which this defendant was present on the 5th of November 1937 that is, the, res the resumption of the Drang nach Austin and the acquisition of Lebensraum in the East was obvious from the terms of this treaty as it had been explicit in Hitler's statement. <coughs> then we come to the fifth part of this defendant's criminality. By accepting and occupying the position of Reich Protector of Bohemia and Moravia, the defendant von Neurath <coughs> personally adhered to the aggression against Czechoslovakia and the world. He further actively participated in the conspiracy of world aggression, and he assumed a position of leadership in the execution of policies involving violating the laws of war and the commission of crimes against humanity. The tribunal will appreciate that I am not going to trespass on the ground of my Soviet colleague and go into the crimes, but I want to show quite clearly to the tribunal the basis for these crimes, which was laid by the legal position which this defendant assumed. The first point, the defendant von Neurath assumed the position of protector under a sweeping grant of powers. The act creating the protectorate provided, if the tribunal would be good enough to turn back to page 126 of the document book and look at article five of the act. <coughs> it reads as follows. As trustee of Reich interests, the leader and chancellor of the Reich shall nominate a Reich protector in Bohemia and Moravia. 
His seat of office will be Prague. Two, the Reich Protector, as representative of the leader and chancellor of the Reich, and as commissioner of the Reich government, is charged with duty of seeing to the observance of the political principles laid down by the leader and chancellor of the Reich. Three, the members of the government of the protectorate shall be confirmed by the Reich Protector, the confirmation may be withdrawn. Four, the Reich Protector is entitled to inform himself of all measures taken by the government of the protectorate and to give advice. He can object to measures calculated to harm the Reich and in case of danger, issue ordinances required for the common interest. Five, the promulgation of laws, ordinances, and other legal announcements, and the execution of administrative measures and legal judgments shall be annulled if the Reich Protector enters an objection. At the very outset of the Protectorate, the defendant von Neurath's supreme authority was implemented by a series of basic decrees which I ask the tribunal to take judicial notice. They established the alleged legal foundation for the policy and program which resulted, all aimed at the systematic destruction of the national integrity of the Czechs. First, by granting the racial Germans in Czechoslovakia a superior order of citizenship. And I um, give the official reference to the decree of the Führer and Reich Chancellor concerning the protectorate, which I just referred, then to an act concerning the representation in the Reichstag of Greater Germany of German nationals resident in the Protectorate of 13th April 1939. Thirdly, an order concerning the acquisition of German citizenship by former Czechoslovakian citizens of German order, origin of the 20th of April. Then there were a series of decrees that granted racial Germans in Czechoslovakia a preferred status at law and in the courts. First, an order concerning the exercise of criminal jurisdiction in the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, the 14th of April. Secondly, an order concerning the exercise of jurisdiction in civil proceedings, the same date. And thirdly, an order concerning the exercise of military jurisdiction of the 8th of May. Then the um, orders also granted to the protector broad powers to change by decree the autonomous law of the protectorate. That is contained in the ordinance on legislation in the protectorate of the 7th of June. And finally, the protector and was authorized together with the Reich leader, SS, the chief of the German police, to take, if necessary, such police measures which go beyond the limits usually varied for police measures. In view of the form of that order, although it is with the tribunal can, in my submission, take judicial notice that it's in the Reich Gazette's that. I have inserted that one in the document book at page 131, because it rather staggers the imagination to know what can be police measures even beyond the limits usually valid for such measures, when one has seen the police measures in Germany between 1933 and 1939. But if such increase was possible, and presumably it was believed to be possible, 
that increased power was given to the defendant von Norat and used by him for the coercion of the Czechs. The declared basic policy of the protector was concentrated upon this central objective of destroying the identity of the Czechs as a nation and absorbing their territory into the Reich. And if the tribunal will be good enough to turn to page 132, they will find document 862 PS, United States Exhibit 313. And although that has been read, the tribunal might bear with me if I just indicated the nature of the document to them. That is a memorandum signed by Lieutenant General of Infantry, Frederike. It is headed the Deputy General of the Armed Forces with the Reich Protector in Bohemia and Moravia. It's marked top secret, dated 15th October 1940. That is practically a year before this defendant von Norad went on leave, as he puts it, on the 27th of September, 1941. And it is called Basic Political Principles in the Protectorate. And there are four copies. It has also gone to the defendant Keitel and the defendant Yodel. And it begins on the 9th October of this year, that is 1940, the office of the Reich Protector held an official conference in which State Secretary SS Lieutenant General K.H. Frank, that is not the defendant Frank, it was the other Carl Herman Frank, spoke about the following. Since creation of the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, party agencies, industrial circles, as well as agencies of the central authorities of Berlin, have had difficulties about the solution of the Czech problem. After ample deliberation, the Reich Protector expressed his views about the various plans in a memorandum. In this, three ways of solution were indicated. A. German infiltration of Moravia and reduction of the Czech nationality to a residual Bohemia. This solution is considered as unsatisfactory because the Czech problem, even if in a diminished form, will continue to exist. B. Many arguments can be brought up against the most radical solution, namely the deportation of all the Czechs. Therefore, the memorandum comes to the conclusion that it cannot be carried out within a reasonable space of time. C, assimilation of the Czechs. That is, absorption of about half the Czech nationality by the Germans, insofar as this is of importance, by being valuable from a racial or other standpoint. This will take place, among other things, also by increasing the Arbeitseinsatz of the Czechs in the Reich territory, with the exception of the Sudeten German border district. In other words, by dispersing the closed Czech nationality. The other half of the Czech nationality must be deprived of its power, eliminated and shipped out of the country by all sorts of methods. This applies particularly to the racially mongoloid part and to the major part of the intellectual class. The latter can scarcely be converted ideologically and would represent a burden by constantly making claims for the leadership over the other Czech classes and thus interfering with a rapid assimilation. Elements which counteract the planned Germanization are to be handled roughly 
and should be eliminated. The above development naturally presupposes an increased influx of Germans from the Reich territory into the protectorate. After a discussion, the Führer has chosen solution C, assimilation, as a directive for the solution of the Czech problem and decided that, while keeping up the autonomy of the protectorate on the surface, the Germanization will have to be carried out in a centralized way by the office of the Reich protector for years to come. From the above, no particular conclusions are drawn by the armed forces. This is the direction which has always been represented from here. In this connection, I refer to my memorandum which was sent to the Chief of the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces, dated 12th July 1939, entitled The Czech Problem. And that is signed, as I said, by the Deputy General of the Armed Forces. Well, that was the view of the Reich Protector, which was accepted and formed the basis of his policy. The result was a program of consolidating German control over Bohemia and Moravia by the systematic oppression of the Czechs through the ab abolition of civil liberties and the systematic undermining of the native political, economic and cultural structure by a range of terror. And this will be dealt with by my Soviet colleagues. They will show clearly, I submit, that the only protection given by this defendant as protector was protection to the perpetrators of innumerable crimes. I have already drawn the attention of the tribunal to the many honors and rewards which this defendant received for his work. And it might well be said that Hitler showered more honors on the defendant von Neurath than on some of the leading Nazis who had been with the party since the very beginning. His appointment on demission of the office of foreign minister as president of the newly created secret cabinet council was a new and singular distinction. On the 22nd September 1940, Hitler awarded him the War Merit Cross First Class as Reich Protector, that is in the Deutsches Nachrichten Bureau reference 22 9, the, September 1940. He was also awarded the golden badge of the party, and as I informed the tribunal, promoted by Hitler personally from Gruppenführer to Obergruppenführer in the SS. And as I also informed the tribunal, he and the defendant von Ribbentrop were, as far as I know, the only two Germans to be awarded the Adler Orden, distinction normally reserved for foreigners. His 70th birthday on the 2nd of February 1943 has made the occasion for most German newspapers to praise his many years of service to the Nazi regime. These services may, in the submission of the prosecution, be summed up in two ways. First, he was an internal fifth columnist among the conservative political circles in Germany. They had been anti-Nazi, but were converted in part by seeing one of themselves in the person of this defendant wholeheartedly with the Nazis. Secondly, his previous reputation as a diplomat made public opinion abroad slow to believe that he would be a member of a cabinet which did not stand by its words and assurances. It was most important for Hitler 
that his own readiness to break every treaty or commitment should be concealed as long as possible. And for this purpose, he found in the defendant von Neurath his handiest tool. That concludes the presentation against the defendant von Neurath.